Hello, everyone, and welcome to NBA Countdown Stay Home Edition. Paul Pierce is out, but Kendrick Perkins was nice enough to join us today. Thanks for joining us, Kendrick. We appreciate you today. Really appreciate you having me back on. Last time I was on, I know I pissed my big brother Jalen off. Jay Hill. <laughs> and look, look Paul, Paul heard I was coming on and he disappeared. Now they're going to double team me. I'm in trouble, trouble, trouble. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. We'll tell Paul what happens after the show is done. But, you know, guys, obviously things have been so tense in America. And the first thing I want to do before we even get into any conversation is ask you how you guys are doing, just checking on strong friends. But, Jalen, let's start with you and how you've been processing everything that's happened over the last, you know, seven days since we've been able to talk to each other. It's been emotional because we work for a sports network. And this was the perfect time of like picking and choosing my spots and biting my tongue and not trying to fight every battle that it was rewarding that I knew that I was about to go on air and say exactly what I wanted to say and didn't care what happened. Mm. And when, when you start to feel like that, it like it, it, it gives you a level of confidence that um, you appreciate what's, I appreciate my job and my profession, but I understand how my community and people need me more. And it's like, it, it's weird watching the people riot and loot. I just want to say something real quick, quick about that for those that don't understand the mentality of people that have been oppressed. What happens is we look at our neighborhoods like prisons. We don't want to be in the hood. Like I'm tired of watching people say like, oh, we gave them a CVS. We gave them a supermarket. Thank you. Th thanks a lot. Th th we, we appreciate the favor. We, we get money. We moving out of the hood. And so we look at it like a prison. Like you ain't listening to us. We trapped. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to burn this thing down until y'all decide that y'all going to hear my voice. And so that's a small percentage of the people other than 98% of people that have been positively protesting. And I just want to give them my support because uh, this is a fight we have fought for a really long time, but there is progress and I wanna make sure everybody keep up the good fight. Her? <clears throat> I mean, my mind been all over the place. As you know, George Floyd was a, a, a guy that was born and raised in the third ward of Houston. Um, I, I've met Floyd a few times and he's mm -hmm. always had that positive energy. And, and the thing that bothers me is that he always brought like that great spirit, that great vibe, like that great energy. Like it was always like, man, if, I, if I'm feeling down, let me go around Floyd. He's always full of energy. And I just recall like the last time me personally being around him, he was, he was preaching to the youngsters because like one of the old heads in the hood was like, say, man, I got this young, this young, this young one right here, he about that action. Like, and Floyd was like, what you mean here about that action? Like, just because he carrying a gun? Like, what we teaching around here right now? Like, and, and that just sticks with me, like, because it, it, it's almost, like, disappointing. And then watching the video that, that was replaying in my mind, like, it replays in my head all day, every day. And I just, it, it's hard because, like Jalen said, you, you don't want to say the wrong thing, but in this situation, it's really no wrong thing. Like, you get to be able to speak out and be yourself because it's time for a change. So it's not, you know, it's not any holding back anymore. Like, you got to ride. You know what I mean? You got to ride for what's right, and, and, and that's just how I feel. Yeah. Um, I feel you both. It's, it's been um, disorienting just everything that's happened. I mean, I kind of feel that way about 2020 in general. That's a bigger story, though. Um, you know, I, I haven't even been on air in the past two days. It's the first time I've been on air since all that stuff happened. Our, our home in Brooklyn got vandalized uh, due to some of the riots. So, you know, I, I felt my first responsibility was also to my family to make sure that they were safe. So we came up here to Maine, and I, I've been just sitting here watching everything and really trying to, again because you know it, it's been interesting so many conversations i've had with my caucasian friends where they haven't even they didn't really even understand how to have that conversation about how can we help what can we do and jay rose I, I appreciate you giving context to why people riot or why things can pop off in a protest 
And I think just to be additive to that, I think you have extremism on both sides that are hijacking protests too. I know there are videos out there, uh, people that aren't from African-American descent who are spray painting Black Lives Matter or vandalizing property and things of that sort that are being politicized, right? Um, so I, I think it, it's also imperative that we talk about this thing holistically about how it's going down, what it is. I, last thing I'll say is, you know, for me, my brain goes to, you know, how can, because we're all privileged to have a platform like this to articulate our perspective where some people aren't privileged to have that platform. So they feel like rioting is the only way that they're heard. So my brain goes to having this platform, like I'm trying to have a call, you know, Bob Johnson about, I don't know if you guys saw him on CNBC the other day, but talking about asking or proposing the government for a close to a $14 trillion reparation act, right? And there's actually an act that's in place called HR 40, which is a bill that it kind of like, uh, it kind of, it's called Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act, talking about essentially the labor that has built the foundation of this country, right? Think about this, the foundation of our country has been built off the backs of slavery and the cotton gin and how that increased the amount of slaves from, you know, one juncture in 1840 was around, you know, 50,000 to 1873 million, three million, and how our whole system of capitalism has been built off taking land from indigenous people to getting more cotton, to bringing more slaves, to building out where we are today in 2020. And, you know, my thing is, it's time for us to, what's the next level of our conversation with strategizing, optimizing, and making sure that we're in sync with how we're delivering our message. And I think that's, I've been feeling that, that heaviness of that responsibility. Jay Rose, I've been seeing you on TV talk about that, Perk, you too, Maria, you too. And I, I, I think that's what that's what our next step is. How do we, because I don't want these guys, if that's second degree murder, they get that and then it's gone again. And then we're in the same perpetual cycle. How do we keep sustaining that and keep moving forward with actual goals to make sure that we can find ways to rebuild our communities and deserve what our what our wealth is? I don't even know what I just said. It, it felt like it was right, but it feels like it's one of those emotional things, you know? Yeah. I mean, everyone's finding ways to deal with it and trying to deliver the message and all. It's not always going to be perfect, but it's still a word or it's how you feel. And that's important during this juncture. I think we've started to see it from coaches. We've seen it from organizations. Um, Everyone has jumped on Twitter or Instagram or some form of social media platform and tried to say, you know, how they feel or whether or not the injustice is right, who they stand for. The Wizards came out and put out a statement. We know the Knicks haven't, you know, so that might say something too. <laughs> um, but if you were an athlete, like currently, because you guys have been there, you've done this. I mean, I think about the college athletes and if my coach says something and do I believe it because I know how you've acted every single day of the week versus, you know, are your words matching up with your actions? I'm just curious what you guys would even want to hear from your organization. What would you even want to hear from your coach and how would you be challenging them at the next level, like what is the next step after you reached out and said, yeah, I don't believe that, you know, black lives should be in value, Jalen. Well, we made a lot of progress, but there's one glass ceiling that we have not been invited into this room and that's called ownership. When that starts to happen, that's when the game changes. When we start to be in position to hire and fire and pick talent and make decisions and do what a lot of industries have done for hundreds of years, hire people that look like themselves, hire people that they're more comfortable with. I think when that happens, we'll see substantial change. But until that happens, I like what current players are trying to do. Let their voices be heard via protest on the ground, whether it's Jalen Brown and Brogdon, I saw them, Enos Cantor, whether it's on, on social media. But again, it's it's not our fight anymore. It's society is trapped at home, Maria. COVID-19, it's a pandemic. And like watching the last dance, all of a sudden the world stopped. It's like, wait, that's actually happened? Well, didn't y'all see the footage of Eric Garner? This ain't the first time we heard somebody say, I can't breathe. And so I, I, I appreciate the, um, the progress, but I can't lie. Sometimes it makes me mad when I think about like that's not the first time clearly, but hopefully that's the, the time that sparks change in so many people. 
because we don't know if it's progress, Jalen. All we are seeing is emotion. You know what I mean? Like we're not necessarily seeing progress. We're seeing an outpouring of emotion and that is completely different from progress and we'll see if we get there. But anyway, Ferg. So, I mean, the, the thing that, that, that I have a hard time separating, I think we all have a hard time separating is like racism or, or like, and, and change for us. Like racism been around for like hundreds of years. Like this is something that we can't change overnight. But what we can change is the system. And like I said this yesterday on the jump, it's like it's almost to the point where we have to call the police on the police, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we need change. Like we need overnight change. We can't change racism overnight. To, to the people out there that are racist and, and, and have that hate in your heart, you know, you just need to cleanse your soul. But at the Preach. end of the day, I'm looking at it like me personally, I'm saying, Okay, Jay Will, you could speak out. Uh, Jay, Jay Rose, you could speak out. Maria, you could speak out. I could speak out. We could all speak out as African Americans and be heard. And yes, it do carry some weight, right? But at the end of the day, people are going to say, you know what? They're just speaking out because it happened to an African American. But when you have someone like the great Greg Popovich speaks out and then you know that's a that's a white American. It, it it sings it sings a different song in my opinion. You know what I mean? Because now you have someone of another race that's speaking out, and then I think it, it need a it need to have a trickle effect. Like I I want I want to hear the great Bill Belichick speak out. I think yeah. that could that carries weight. I want to hear you know uh uh Bob Bob Aaron of boxing who you know uh a racist uh uh. Culture, other cultures have made him hundreds of millions of dollars in boxing. Speak out about it. I just think it it carries a different weight and it bring it, it sings a different song. So you know, and then on top of that, I just want to say like thank you to all those guys like Stephen Jackson, Jalen Brown, you know, uh, all the rappers, Bun B, Jamie Fox for standing on the front line because. What people don't understand is that's not an easy task. Like to go out there and be in the thick of things, you're putting your life on the line. And as we know, we have lost all time greats who, who stood on the front line. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and, 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 and Muhammad Ali went to jail. So like, you know, I pray for those guys every single day that they make it back home safely and get through, you know, the protesting or whatever. But at the end of the day, we can't change racism overnight, but we can change the system. Yeah, Perk, I'm with you. Um, you know, I, this stuff and us covering the NBA makes me very fortunate that we have a person as pragmatic and as aware as Adam Silver, who's kind of leading this charge. Uh, even though Adam Silver is not an African American male uh, or person, I think he is, uh, the time I spent around him, he's extremely astute with listening to people and understanding, showing a lot of empathy about, you know, what their struggles are, some of the things. And I, I think the NBA, for the most part, I mean, for the best part, is on the right side of history here. I think they will be progressive with this. Um, you know, Maria, to get back to your question about the Knicks, I, I hear what people are saying. I, I'm not advocating for saying that Jim Dolan is a great owner or anything, but I will say this. A man had an all-black front office. I didn't see a lot of NBA teams ever have that uh, with Scott Perry and Steve Mills. And maybe it didn't pan out, um, but just to play devil's advocate there, because I spent some time with those guys and you can sit there and critique, you know, what they did for the organization, whether it was right or wrong, uh, but it, it takes opportunity. So I, I think that is something to acknowledge about the Knicks organization too, as much as we talk poorly about them in a lot of different ways, uh, they did give opportunity in that regard. Yeah, but... But Jack, just to touch back on that, I mean, like, the the Knicks has had a dark cloud over them for over like over a decade now, and I'm talking about things that happen off the court, you know, incidents that that have happened off the court. So, you know, I thought that yesterday or right now is a golden opportunity for them to step forward and and shine and shine some sunlight. On, on not only the world, but their organization. We're talking about um, the NBA's NBA most valuable franchise, like not speaking out. And I and I have a problem with that. Like, 
Why not? Why not? Like, you know what I mean? And, and, and it's, it's almost like the word that comes to mind is privilege. You know what I mean? You look at, at, at Dolan and he's privileged. He didn't get it out the mud. He didn't grow up in the hood. Like, he, he was inher he inherited a billions of dollars. He inherited the New York Knicks. Like, he don't know. So he, it's like, to me, he just sitting back like, hey, I'm living my life. I ain't got to speak on that. Why not? Like, this is what we're talking about. In order for us to have change, so what if he hired African Americans in the, in the front office? That could have been a front. Like, that uh, that just could have been a front in hiding who he really is. Like, at the end of the day, no, now is the time to speak out. Like, no, it, like, guys like him are, are, is going to be the reason that the system changed, not us. I agree. I mean, look, you could be a perk. Um I think both things could be true, man. Maybe it was a front. Um, and I, I wasn't saying that neglects, like that negates his actions. I was, I, I agree with you on them not speaking out about what's going on. So I'm, I'm with you. I just know Scott and I know Steve personally. I could tell you that maybe they made some poor decisions, but it, it, it was, it did feel different. I know we're here now, but like watching that in time, spending time, Jay Rose, you spent time with them too. You know them. Like it, it did feel like, okay, that's an opportunity. But I'm with you too. That could be fair as well. I, I don't think this is one where it's like, I'm writing you're wrong. I, I think no, no, both no, things no. could be true. And it's not no knock on them because from I, from my understanding is that they wanted to speak out. Like I, like players, some of the people in the organization wanted to speak out. It's, it's no knock on, on Perry or Mills. I would just tell, I would just speak on Dolan. Like, you yeah. know, at the end of the day, he's the one that is going to say, is going to give the okay. So that's all I was saying when I was referring to the Knicks organization. And at the end of the day, inaction is an action that can be taken too. And I think that that says something still. Like, and, and we're learning that now, obviously, in this time. Um, I'm just curious for you guys, because we have this platform, and I think that, we, we do have a privilege, like I accept that, that my privilege was I got to go to college for free and I get to, because I went to Georgia, I have this job and blah, blah, blah. And Jalen, you leave Detroit and you get to make money and now you have a job through sport. Like we all have a privilege, but now we can speak to the privilege. Like we can have a conversation with a white man right now. And this is, this is the moment, that's the last question. Just like, what do you want the majority to know? We don't need to talk to minorities anymore. Like, I don't need to have that conversation. I've had been hit up several times by my white colleagues about what they can do or where they can go from here. And to be honest, I struggle with that question. So I'm almost asking you guys for help with it. Like, what are we supposed to say to them? I think uh, it's important. While we've come so far, we still have so very far to go. So I'll give you this example. You know how when you look back at pictures of yourself, and you laugh at the outfits you were wearing or the hairstyles that you had. Think about that as it relates to things that took place in our country. And the majority, ask yourself, what were you saying when you heard the terms reparations? What, what were you saying when you heard the terms affirmative action? Mm -hmm. Or when there was an Ali summit or when they raised the fist at the Olympics or when Colin took a knee, what were you saying? And it's okay that what you feel now is different then, but it's important to acknowledge it. And once you are able to do that, it unlocks something in you that's going to resonate in your house with your family. Your kids already have it. I'm going to tell you, your kids already have it. It's called rap music. They already have it. So y'all just got to catch up. <laughs> you know, I, I my brain goes to, like I know I said, the HR 40 Act, like reparation, J. Rose, you're right. I'm with you. You know, else I've been been watching a lot of, um, you know, I wonder a lot of this stuff is, is, is learned behavior because it's been institutionally uh, taught for so long. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Jane Elliott, uh, but you know she's been going around a lot lately where she did some of these case studies like in the 60s and 70s where a full room of Caucasian people, she treated blue-eyed people differently than she treated brown-eyed people. And you watch over this two-week span how they started blaming each other for one set or one faction having more privileges than others. 
And it was a it was a great case study. And she did it in an Oprah show too. Oprah did it you know, 20 years later, where it was a great reflection moment for just people in general to feel like she Oprah on Oprah show, she asked everybody, for all my Caucasian people in the in the crowd or Asian people, raise your hand if you would like to be treated from this point out like an African American would be treated. And nobody raised their hand. And she said, wait, I don't think you guys heard my question. Raise your hand if you want to be treated like an African-American would be treated from this point out throughout the rest of your life. And nobody raised your nobody raised their hands. She's like, so my question is to you, if you know it's going on, why aren't you doing anything about it? Why aren't you doing it? It was, it was riveting to hear her say that. So, you know, if this conversation leads to us having more brothers in arms to continue to push the narrative about things that, our country has been built off the backs or things that reparation, that, that should be a comfortable word that people should get comfortable having conversations about and be open-minded to navigating and strategizing about how we can make stuff like that happen. That's where my conversation goes. Hmm. Well, I mean, to, to be honest, Maria, I, I don't have the answer. And I think Jalen and Jay just took us to church and spoke the gospel. But I will say this. Um, I grew up in the hood, right? I grew up in the hood. The now the community that I live in is 20 houses. I'm the only African American that live in the community. My sons go to school with 80% white, right? My sons have Caucasian friends. I have Caucasian friends. I'm going to give you an incident that happened to me on Sunday. Now, my best, my son, my oldest son, best friend, he's Caucasian. Now, I know the family of, you know, I've been knowing them for three or four years. They asked, they said, hey, can, can little Ken come over? We're having a pool party and, you know, you know, don't worry about anything. Everything is going to be okay. And, and, you know, the dad just kept going on and on. And, and I stopped him. And I said, I said, Jeff, wait a second. I said, my brother, I've been knowing you for three or four years now. My son then went with you to water parks. My son then went with you to football games. You don't have to explain to me who you are as a person. I know who you are as a person. Like, you don't don't let this situation that's going on affect our relationship because I don't view you any differently. And I let my son go over, and he spent the whole day over there. So, you know, it's, it, it's a teaching point, and it's more so like, you know, I just don't, I just don't want to, and I'm teaching my sons and the younger generation that I don't want African-American kids looking at, you know, because of what these police officers done that all white people or other people from races are bad people because, listen, we have Caucasian people that are out there protesting. I just seen a, a photo of one crying in, in Stephen Jackson arms on Instagram. So, no, it's, it's not like that. It, we have African-Americans that are racist. We have Spanish people that are racist. I mean, racism don't, don't, don't have a side. So, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't have the answer to your question, Marie. I think Jalen and Jay just spoke the gospel on it. But I just, you know, it's just to the point where it goes back to what I first said. It's just if you're a racist and you have that hate in your heart, you know, the best thing you can do is cleanse your soul. Like, just mm-hmm. cleanse your soul. That's the best way I could put it. Yeah, that brings up a story that, you know, I've never told anyone but my bosses, but I've been on the road before doing work in Southern football games, so y'all know what that looks like, and been on the sidelines and been asked to take a picture. And I was like, I refuse it. The person was really drunk. And he got mad at me and called me uh, N-word B-I-T-C-H. And I just remember, you know, there's nothing that I can do in that moment that's going to fix that. There's nothing for me to say. And there's no way for me to, if I harbor hatred in my heart for all white men in America after that happens, then I can't go to work every day. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't talk to my bosses and accept their criticisms and, you know, have conversations with them about what show we're going to do. But at the end of the day, that's the weight and expectation that everyone, I'm not the only one that's dealt with that. Like, I guarantee you, Jalen and Perk and Jay will have heard the same things. This is not a unique story to any of us, but that's the burden that we carry every single day 
And so I do believe that when you, if you're a white person, you're having a conversation with your friend, understand that they have had and dealt with a situation like that. And yet they still come at you with love and they still will re respond to you and answer your questions and have conversations. And we will still be in rooms that look nothing like us and be forced to be comfortable. And that's who we are and what we have to be. And if anything, I would tell you to be more like black people. Like at the end of the day, like we are forced to be considerate and helpful and, you know, bear burdens that we don't deserve to bear. Like, if anything, y'all should be looking at our community like, we need to try to be more like that. <laughs> and that's the, that's the crazy thing to say, but that is a real thing. So, I mean, I appreciate you guys. Obviously, everyone's sharing stories. That's the only way that we're going to see change. Jalen, you being on Get Up and saying what you say means something. Perk, you getting on and humanizing who George Floyd is, that matters. And Jalen, or Jay Will, you sharing you know, giving us history and historical facts like that matters. So we're going to keep doing this. We're going to be back here on Thursday having these conversations. Y'all have comments, questions, critiques, let us know because that's what we're here for. And um, I just appreciate you guys. Stay safe. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.